Let's get started today, and welcome to this webinar. We're joined by four great panelists. The webinar will be on the Venture Capital Outlook, Healthcare Venture Capital Outlook for 2023. We'll talk with each of our panelists about sort of what they see as the overall outlook, areas that they're positive about, that they see a lot of interest in, areas that they see less interest in, and then finally, where they're most focused and excited uh, what they're most focused and excited about. We've got four terrific panelists. Let me briefly tell you who they are, then I'll ask each to introduce themselves. We've got Dr. Robert Groves, Executive Vice President, Chief Medical Officer of Banner Aetna. He'll talk about his role and what he's seeing. Dr. Trishal Kapoor, brilliant serial founder, and we'll talk about his perspective. We have two brilliant folks from sort of the consulting world. Um, we've got Dave Davies from Ernst Young Parthenon, EY Parthenon, uh, and we have Matt Wolf from RSM, who's a regular guest on the Becker Private Equity Podcast, the Becker Business Minute Podcast. Thank you to our audience for joining us. I'll start by asking each of our panelists to give a 30, 60 second introduction. Then we'll come back to each panelist to talk about what they sort of see as the outlook for venture capital and their interest in what they see over the last year and going forward this year. Dr. Groves, would you mind taking a moment to introduce yourself? I'd be happy to. Thank you so much for uh, uh, inviting me, Scott. I am uh, Robert Groves. I'm the Executive Vice President, Chief Medical Officer for Banner Aetna, which is a true joint venture uh, between Banner Health, about a $10 billion delivery system, integrated delivery system based in Phoenix, Arizona, and of course, Aetna slash CBS and 50-50 ownership. So in, in sort of an interesting position to, to view uh, the evolution of healthcare of late uh, through the pandemic, et cetera. Um, my background is uh, pulmonary critical care. I practiced for um, a couple of decades uh, uh, and uh, then was recruited by Banner back in 2005 to roll out uh, the electronic ICU. And uh, from there, uh, occupied a number of uh, spots in Banner and was vice president of health management for that organization before moving over to the joint venture in uh, uh, 2017. Our charge at the joint venture is to uh, transform the way care is delivered in Arizona. Big, big uh, task in front of us. And we've grown to about 415 or so thousand members over the course of uh, five years, so five and a half years now. And we are concentrated in commercial and individual markets. We're not doing Medicare or Medicaid at present. Thank you very much. Fascinating. And, and Dr. Kapoor, can you take a moment to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Scott. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm currently in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Michigan. Uh, prior to that, I did uh, training at general surgery at the Mayo Clinic. Um, I've been involved in medical entrepreneurship for over a decade. Uh, Started my first company when I was an undergrad. Created a, a smartphone application for error reporting through the first SDK toolkit that iPhone came out with with my high school buddies. We sold that to a group practice, and then eventually my focus became on biomedical diagnostics, patented a mechanism for detecting cystic fibrosis with touch screens. And then with MAP Pharmaceuticals, I got acquired by Allergan and subsequently Pfizer. And then for the past few years, I've been extremely focused in uh, big data analytics, predictive analytics, and AI foundation platforms. And then uh, currently an advisor to multiple startups and uh, private investing groups in Silicon Valley uh, with a key focus in digital health platforms. Fantastic. And I, and I wonder, I'll just ask you quickly, Dr. Kapoor, are you a University of Michigan fan or not a University of Michigan fan? After that loss, you've got to help me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. And, and uh, Dave Davies, can you take a moment and introduce yourself and tell us about EY Parthenon as well? Thanks, Scott. appreciate you having me. Uh, Dave Davies, I'm a partner with EY Parthenon's healthcare private equity team based out of Denver. And, and our team spends a lot of time working with both private equity sponsors as well as health systems, thinking through areas for investment that, that span the gamut of venture capital and private equity. I spend most of my time on the team focused on the provider side of the house, so many of the physician practice platforms that are out there, as well as multi-site providers in behavioral health, optometry, optima, or optometry, physical therapy, and the like, as well as working with our health system clients to think about, you know, what are innovative ways to transform care through investment 
primarily in, in digital health. And so we are often either tracking for our health system customers, the, the goings on within venture capital, or we're, we're tracking it for our private equity clients as they look for opportunities to um, invest and, and bring along in the assets that they have, the portfolio companies to, to better their care delivery. So excited to be with you here today. Thank you very, very much. And just as an aside, I know University of Colorado Healthcare has a is an incredible innovation program as well, as you mentioned that you're out in the Denver Denver area. And, and Matt, can you take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us just a bit about RSM and your practice? Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Scott. So I'm uh, at RSM. I help lead our healthcare private equity and venture capital team, which is a broad kind of accounting and consulting group, uh, really focused as RSM as a firm on early stage and middle market companies. Uh, so we really probably see more transactions, at least in healthcare, in the middle market and early stage than probably any other firm or, or close to. So we, we really see from a broad perspective, similar to Dave across providers um, and health technology. And that's really where I spent a lot of my time is at that, that uh, on the health technology side, I grew up in our provider practice. So I still have a lot of clients there too, but it's been just fascinating to watch health technology as that's evolved over the past 15 years that I've been at RSM. Um, and in addition to serving clients that way, I'm also one of our healthcare senior analysts. So I spent a lot of my time just working with our economists and other analysts studying what's going on in the macroeconomic environment, what's going on in healthcare, what does that mean for our clients, and what does that mean for our people serving those clients? And then I get to share that viewpoint um, at great panels like this. Thank you, Matt, very much. And let me again, I'm going to come back to each of our panelists now and ask them what they're seeing. The, the general, what, what people have generally seen in the market is huge amount of investment in 2021, 2020. That started to slow a lot at the end of 2022. I, I'll ask our panelists for their perspective on the venture capital outlook in healthcare next. Dr. Groves, take a moment and tell us. You've got this fascinating perspective of a joint venture between a payer and a large health system. Uh, the, the large health system does their own venture investing as well. Aetna, of course, probably does a huge amount of venture investing. What are, what are you seeing out there in terms of venture or investing or the things that you're interested in from your perspective as an, as an operator and a leader of, of, a, of a sort of what would really be thought of as almost a pay provider? What, what do you see out there and, and, and what's your perspective, Dr. Groves? Yeah, I, you know, from where I sit, uh, you know, first of all, I think that uh, the, the the pullback in uh, venture capital investment is probably a good thing. Uh, you know, in that there's a there's a time of reckoning, right? I mean, hospital margins are being uh, uh, crunched, and uh, you know, uh, patients can't afford health care. I mean, there are a lot of things that are going on that make this uh, a really important time. There's the fear of a recession, what might happen. And so I think uh, what, uh, what I see anyway is that uh, there's, there's sort of a hunkering down and looking for real value uh, rather than uh, pie in the sky uh, investments. But what I'm looking for and, and what I think still has uh, a, a huge future, there, there are two areas that I think are critical. And, and one is around uh, patient engagement. Uh, whoever cracks that nut is going to be very successful. We got a lot of great programs, right? You've got telehealth, you've got uh, home care, you've got all of these things, but the engagement of patients in taking advantage of these things often remains in the single digits. So what is it that we need to do to actually get patients to take advantage of the services that are available to them? Some of that is navigation. Some of that, it might be incentives. But but those companies that are focused on how do we get patients engaged, I think, uh, have a future, uh, particularly those that are successful. And there, there are several of them out there that are using nudge theory or, or Vegas theory. You know, there are two ways to go about this. Uh, and so I think those are areas that are really important. The other place that I think is critically important, and it's because of the workforce challenge, huge challenge in workforce in healthcare, as you know. And, and so anything that can improve automation, that can streamline the functions of a health system, uh, that can make it easier to get stuff done, uh, has a, a future. And, and that's a great place to be right now if you're trying to get venture capital, I would hope, because those are the areas that I see as most important to us right now. And, and, and talk for a moment. When you think about patient engagement, 
somebody's going for a procedure, that they do more of the prep online digitally, more of their understanding of what they're going to go through digitally. When you think of patient engagement, when they're navigating houses, give us an example of what you sort of because there's so many different definitions of patient engagement. What do you what what do you see there? And then with each patient engagement and workforce automation, workforce automation, I think there's nothing more near and dear to systems right now than ways to relieve the need for more people and find ways to still deliver great care. Are there things in the patient engagement world or the workforce automation world that you're particularly that you've been particularly excited about so far? And you're free to name products. We don't care if they're sponsors or not. Anything that you've seen that you've been particularly interested in so far in either of these areas? Yeah, well, uh, let me let me talk about uh, one company that uh, I've been very impressed with because it's an area where nobody thought it could be done, and that's Verta Health. And what they do is help folks reverse diabetes. Now, when I say that, you know, it, it, it uh, uh, blasphemy is the first response I get from most physicians. It, and you want to call it remission, call it remission. But what I've seen is that, and they have published data on this, they take patients who have diabetes and uh, at a year, at a year, uh, 60% of those patients are off of all diabetes medications and their hemoglobin A1C is below the diagnostic threshold. That's impressive. And they do this while retaining uh, 75 to 80% of those patients. And it's not, you know, we, we've all heard that, you know, these, these diet systems don't work. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. But what happens is because they have every single piece of what I call or what they call continuous remote care in place, Patients do actually engage and they get better and they talk about it with their peers and more peers sign up. So that's one example of what I mean by patient engagement. Patients accomplishing, 60% of those patients accomplishing tremendous health gains uh, by interacting with this company. The other area uh, where I see this is it has to do with the automation. You know, I, when I schedule an airline ticket, it's very, very simple. I do it on my app and I know what's available to me, et cetera. Uh, there's a company called Care Cognitics that has a very flexible uh, program that they, uh, a platform technology, I'll call it, that they, we, we, we ran a pilot at one of our cardiology practices in Phoenix. And, and what they found is that through giving uh, uh, patients this uh, ability to self-help, self-schedule, uh, and, and communicate with their doc via text, you know, anytime, uh, it, you know, or, or with their team any time, what we saw was that about a 30% reduction in no-shows. Uh, we saw a 50% improvement in productivity of the front office and phone staff because patients are taking care of their own problems. Uh, and we see patients that are interacting with their caregivers on a more regular basis. It's sort of a platform technology that takes us closer to that continuous remote care strategy that Verda has implemented so successfully. So those are two examples of what I mean. Thank you. No, and, and great examples. Thank you. Dr. Kapoor, let me turn to you. You've got this great background as both an entrepreneur, practicing physician, advisor to venture capital firms. What are you seeing currently? What's the appetite for investment in the early stage of these companies? What are you seeing? Is it softened some since the boom's off the rose of some of the valuations, or is there still just tremendous appetite? Is it early, early stage, mid stage? Dr. Kapoor, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, that's a great question, Scott. You know, before I answer that, I'll say I agree with Dr. Groves 100%, and I'm so happy to hear, you know, someone at senior leadership adopting digital health so aggressively. I think it's what's needed. Um, from the venture capital side, you know, the pace of venture investment, uh, particularly in late stage tech valuations, have been declining steadily throughout 2022. Um, interestingly, though, early state in investment activity is growing significantly. And that's because firms are probably waiting for stability to public market. Uh, the theme of portfolio companies has shifted. Um, you know, it was aggressive scaling and now it's extended the runway, reducing the cash burn. And they're starting to explore non-equity financing, such as debt financing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a down cycle for sure. Uh, but, you know, what most people I, I don't think realize that VCs are sitting on a substantial amount of dry powder or cash and they're motivated to invest, but they're just waiting for stability to be achieved in the market along with valuations. As I said, you know, I, uh, it's predicted that venture growth deal value will fall uh, due to investments in 22 moving away from late stage and more mature companies. 
good news is that there may be fewer companies looking to raise play stage venture capital due to expected down rounds in 2023. Uh, the companies will likely focus on perhaps just sustainable growth and cost cutting to stay away from the difficult capital raising market. However, you know, seed stage startup valuations and deal sizes will continue to reach new annual heights, and we're already seeing that. Um, there certainly has been a correction valuations, but I think there is more to come over this next year. You know, majority of fund managers are forecasting a downturn in the coming year. It'll be difficult to hear from any startups, at least for the first uh, half of the year or so, especially, you know, seeing that IPO, IPO windows are shut tight. Many tech and life science companies are poised for growth or exit or contemplating a capital raise, merger, or maybe even a sale. And even the avenue of special purpose acquisition company, IPOs and mergers, will they'll continue to decline for the first half. Thank you. You mentioned companies, you know, talked to one CEO of venture capital funded company at one point and not very long ago, and it said the venture capital firm almost views me as not doing my job if I'm not running at a certain burn rate and trying to grow quickly, because they're, they're not looking for sort of an okay outcome, they're looking to really grow into something very significant. Now all of a sudden you've got growth slowing at a lot of these venture capital funded companies. You've got some layoffs, you've got all of a sudden protection of the run rate, trying to reduce that run rate, that loss rate, so that it doesn't get too out ahead of the size company they think they're gonna grow. Can you talk a little bit about the slowing of the run rates and that you talked about down rounds as well? Just give a little more color to those two concepts if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's always been about return of investment. And then the market previous in the previous year was fantastic. I mean, valuations were sky high. We were looking to scale and there was a lot of opportunity because there was money to spend. But Dr. Groves, you know, identified that, well, it's not the case anymore, even though healthcare has been somewhat resistant to re recession. Most healthcare organizations, particularly, have been, you know, working on like a negative margin or a clear uh, close margin. So it's about cutting costs or increasing revenue generating opportunities. So if you're not showing that ROI and you're trying to still build the product and grow your team or platform, you have to take that with, you know, a grain of salt and maybe slow down because companies were doubling and tripling their, you know, staffing. And all of a sudden now there's, that customer pipeline doesn't quite exist because of the current market and it's not stabilized quite yet. So now they're saying, well, maybe we moved a little too quick. Let's extend our pathway, focus on the product, slow down the sales cycle and see what we can do. No, fascinating. And, and, and so forth. And so interesting because like you, you mentioned the, the dreaded down round and the down round happens when a company has been valued at a really high valuation, often the case based on real high expected growth and then isn't going into that valuation as quickly as expected, but they've got a run rate where they still need to raise capital again. It's so rather being, than being another $5 billion valuation, now the valuation is back down to 2 or $3 billion, and that causes a lot of stress on the both operators, the CEO, as well as the investors. Is that a fair assessment, Dr. Kapoor? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, even when things were good in 2022, you know, some of the startups that I was advising, they got ridiculous valuations and we made the cognitive decision that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen over the next year or two, you know, understand sort of the range of evaluation and maybe target for the bottom 25th quartile or the 50th percentile. And then at least we have hope of gaining traction because yes, you can get a massive high valuation from some firms, but know that other firms will not follow that lead later on down the line if you don't meet certain metrics. Depending if you're seed stage, it's about product market fit. If you're series A, it's about hyper growth and subsequent growth rounds. So you have to read what's going on outside of your environment and your company first before you accept a certain valuation, but 100% agree with you. Thank you. And, and, and Dave, let me ask you what you're seeing. Your UI Parthenon, brilliant reputation, Talk about what you're seeing out there in the market, the venture capital outlook. What are you seeing? Yeah, I think the, the outlook similar to, to what Dr. Groves and Kapoor mentioned, you know, from venture capital all the way through private equity, there's a pause right now. It, it, there is dry powder that, that is building up. There, there's a desire to, to re-enter at some point in the near future, but the valuations need to be at that right point. And, and so I think the other thing you know, while things like late late stage investments have slowed down, there there are opportunities existing there for the right type of assets. 
thinking about things like value-based care enablers, and, and historically we've seen a lot of that on, on the payer side of the house, but turning away from the hospitals to the independent physician practices, to the outpatient providers and things like that, to, to provide them with the insight, the intelligence, the data and analytics to, to support participation in that, because I think there's going to be over the next two to three years in this market across the entire healthcare spectrum, a recommittal to value-based care in a broad sense of things. And so I think it's looking to those opportunities where there are the right type of assets that are going to continue to see strong valuations and should, should move forward. I think the other example of that being like a shift med, which is late stage VC, just closed for a couple hundred million dollars in, in funding. And they are addressing that, that staffing shortage that Dr. Groves mentioned. I think um, in addition to some of the elements like, like automation, I think workflow tools and workflow enablers are, are another key dynamic um, that's gonna be critical in these periods and potentially still gonna see activity despite some of the pauses in the other areas of, of the digital tools. Thank you. And you, you mentioned, you know, as Dr. Gross had patient engagement and workforce automation, but you also mentioned companies that are, that are growing and, and seeking capital to provide tools to providers, to systems, to others for value-based care and for other types of analytics related to that. Is that where you see a lot of the activity, companies that are selling into practices and not necessarily provider-driven platforms, but selling into providers, selling into facilities and so forth, technology for value-based yes. care and some of the other things that are, that are needed? Yes, I, I think that's a great way to highlight it. It's thinking about the physician practices like a tech-enabled service almost. And, and so some of the latter stage things we've seen are things like Sword and Hinge Health, where physical therapists initially thought, you know, is this a MSK replacement for our, our tools? The answer is likely no. It, it's a complementary tool to the in-facility in physical therapy. Similarly, as you think about oncology, I think that's another space that there's a lot of need. There's so much diversity around the types of carcinomas that are being treated. And so it's selling into the providers um, to give them the tools to effectively and efficiently treat the, the patient population in a manner that, that is both bespoke to the patient's needs, but also somewhat um, standardized in nature. So, so they're getting the right care at the right time, but, but in a effective and efficient manner. And, and that's something that I think historically hasn't seen as much of a focus. It's been focused on the payer and the health systems, but but selling those, those tech enablement tools to the, the providers and the individual practices is going to be increasingly important over the next 12 to 24 months. And, and, and let me ask you this question, Dave. We see so many, like you mentioned Hinge Health, and that's a great example. It, you know, platform for PT, musculoskeletal, I believe. And, and what you see when an area is sort of a, is looked at by new operators, by startups, by VC, it's amazing to me the different variants of outcomes, not outcomes necessarily care-wise. Well, I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of outcome difference care-wise, but for example, the Hospital for Special Surgery, HSS, just, you know, launched and partnered on a huge, you know, platform related to physical therapy. But, but some of them seem to really thrive and grow. Others, often founded by a couple of doctors, either can end up having great runway and doing great, or sort of at some point sort of fall apart because they can't get distribution, they can't grow, they can't develop it into a much bigger channel type thing. Any thoughts on, on how you look at what's likely to have success versus not when people look at these earlier stage companies? There's so many chasing things like tools for oncology care, tools for value-based care, tools for PT, and some end up doing great, some only get to a certain spot and then sort of you know, slow down as the entrepreneurial physician or leader behind it slows down. Any thoughts on what leads to success versus not? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it does come down to that leadership team and that willingness to maybe bring the right leaders in to, to take it beyond the entrepreneurial physician or practice, um, to, to find the individuals that are either serial entrepreneurs or just experts in the space to, to provide that expertise to, to bring um, the practice along to be very thoughtful, like Dr. Kapoor mentioned, to, to, to not take evaluation that, that puts you too far down the path, because sometimes you're, you're the source of your own demise. 
And then I think there is also, you know, they are often very similar doing similar types of things, but, but it's have they actually considered the entire ecosystem of participants to include the, the physicians that might be offering the service, the patients that are utilizing it, the payers that are going to be involved, are they going to see the value? Oftentimes the ones that falter are the right mousetrap for one participant, but they're not the right mousetrap for the entire ecosystem. No, and that's absolutely the case, isn't it? That that sometimes you've got something that really works for somebody, but not necessarily scalable, which is a very different thing. And sometimes a practice falls in love with the tool or a small group falls in love with the tool, but that doesn't mean everybody else is going to as well. I mean, a fascinating perspective. Matt, let me turn to you. Matt Wolf, we get a chance to visit with Matt regularly. He's an RSM, a leader there. Always a pleasure to visit with. Matt, what's your outlook? What are you seeing out there in venture capital? What What, what do you see out there? I mean, similar to the other guests, I, I think I want to paint maybe a little bit, perhaps more of a bullish uh, angle on that. I think, you know, 2022 fundraising was down across health technology. It was still a great year for overall investment in health technology. You know, 2021 was king, of course, but 2022 was still a great year. And as I look at the fundamentals, or as we look at the fundamentals that drive health technology investment and need, and, and Dr. Groves touched on many of them are or some of them are, are, are is the labor environment specifically, right? We look at the sustainability of healthcare provider and to some degree, even payer margins. And what does that look like going forward? And how are they going to sustain themselves and their margins when the cost of labor is increasing two to four times the historical rate mean and lagging reimbursement and reimbursement challenges persist in terms of prior authorizations and fighting denials, the only solution to that is investment in technology that increases the total productivity of that labor force, allowing clinicians to practice at the tops of their license, spend more time with patients, less time documenting in EHR. On the non-clinical side, how are we going to automate, redesign processes, automate tasks, not jobs, because we need all of those people, um, but we need to free them up so that they can do strategic things and better think about how are we going to play into more digital health and really lean into that. And, and, and that's the only way we're going to get through that. And I think one of the other opportunities, too, I like to highlight that we've seen within our own client base. And, and Scott, you mentioned earlier, you know, we see the headlines around big tech layoffs and what that means for the overall technology early stage ecosystem. I actually think it's kind of a buying opportunity for health technology companies, right? We've, we've had an advantage of saying, OK, you can go work for a big name tech company as an engineer and they're going to shower you with money or you can come here and, and help save lives or help improve clinical outcomes. And, you know, that's always kind of helped. But now when you see all these headlines around the big tech names laying off thousands, tens of thousands of workers, that message plays even better. And we've had a lot of clients that have been very successful in scooping up really talented um, technologists from outside of health tech in this environment. So I think um, I think there's a lot of reasons to be to be bullish over the overall uh, health technology VC ecosystem. And you know, yeah, we're going to see an overall economic recession likely sometime this year. Healthcare will likely be somewhat insulated from that. Um, we're not without our challenges, but I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic for 2023 and beyond. Thank you, Matt, very much. You, you make a number of great points. So there's still significant technology investment. And I think as Dr. Groves mentions, as others mentioned, even though the VC funding has slowed some and the valuations are, are the, the boom is off the rose, there's not been really a reduction in the appetite from health systems that need to find technology-driven solutions. You know, one CEO sort of phrased it to me as follows, systems have really two choices. They either invest in tech and, and try and sort of change the equation in terms of margins by making enough investments in technology to do some of the things that Dr. Groves and everybody else has talked about, this you know workforce automation and so forth, and patient engagement, or they double down on staff, and at the end of the day, given the inflationary cost of staff, if the answer is solely doubling down on staff, that it, it's almost impossible to have the, to have the reimbursement outrun the increase in staff costs, you end up in trouble. So it sort of leaves you in a spot that, that at least the premise of one technology CEO has been really successful is they have to invest in technology or 
going to end up in trouble because you can't win the other way. Man, any thoughts on that? Does that resonate or what are, what are your thoughts around that? Oh, absolutely. Um, like I said, you know, we've seen for the past year, depending on the sector you want to look at within healthcare, those healthcare provider costs overall, including both non-clinical and clinical labor, increasing anywhere from six to nine percent year over year each month, which is, like I said, two to four times what most providers budget as their annual increase in wages. And when you figure that about half the healthcare providers in the U.S. or a little less than half are kind of eking by on zero to three percent operating margins, it, it, it's just unsustainable. Um, and the only the only solution really is investment in technology. You need your people to you need to be able to do more with less because you know pe people don't just grow on trees, right? Um, it's uh, it's it's the only sustainable solution is in, is smart investment in in key technology solutions. And great people, and great people. It's a combination. We all think. I think we all want to. We all recognize that it's a combination of both: great people and great tech. Exactly, Scott. If I can, let me start. I just, just to. I, I, right, I, need to I need to clarify that a little bit. As I said before, though, I mean, um, we want to automate tasks. We want to change tasks, but we definitely don't want to get rid of anybody um, that that we can repurpose into a different role at that provider because we're all just so hard up for people. Um, that's a, it's a great point and bears repeating, I think. Thank you. Let me, let me do this. Let's take the turn now and come back the other way. And I'll start with you, Matt. Then I'll go to Dave, then Dr. Kapoor, then Dr. Groves. Let, let, let me do this. We've got about 10 minutes left. Matt, take a moment. Tell us about what areas most excited about, you know, where do you see the most excitement? What are you most excited about in terms of the, the venture capital investing in healthcare? Yeah, ho hopefully this doesn't uh, say too much about my personality, but I, I think the boring areas, right? We talked about some really cool patient engagement and like kind of consumer facing applications, but I think there's a lot of um, opportunity to improve the economic value out of healthcare when we look sort of behind the curtain and solutions that, that don't solve interoperability per se, because you can't solve it, but maybe address it, right? What are some low or no code solutions that put analytics in the in the hands of smaller providers that are without those tools, but do it in a way that help them communicate more broadly with the ecosystem and participate in coordinated care and improve their own economics. It, it's stuff that the patient never sees, um, but I think it's there's a lot of opportunity there in our sort of, you know, we're basically a, a $4 trillion cottage industry in healthcare. And some of this behind the scenes technology, I think, has a really, really high uh, um, threshold, I think, for adding economic value and improving margins, just helping us all to do more with less, improve outcomes, all of that. And the patients probably never see any of it. Thank you. And some of the some of the real strides we've made in things like AI automation applied to revenue cycle and some other areas where patients kind of see it, might not see it directly, but has been a real help in terms of workforce automation and so forth. Dave, let me turn to you. Where are you most excited or where do you see some of your clients most excited when you look at venture capital investing in healthcare? Yeah, so, so I think I mentioned it a bit on one and, and I'll give two areas. The, the first being similar to Matt, the, the things that are back end, they're enables of, en enablers of value-based care and really just high quality delivery overall. So, so the things that insurers have been doing risk adjustment for years, the things that allow a, a physician to look at their patient population and understand the relative risk of that population, what is their potential to do, do bundled payments, do subcapitation or whatever else. There's not as much available across many of the specialties. And I think some of the really interesting areas there are musculoskeletal, oncology and behavioral health, all, all areas where we spend a ton of money. We've got a lot of distribution of providers. We've got a lot of very small providers playing in the market. So the things that sort of brings power, data and information to providers to empower them to, to care for patients better. And then I think the other one, I, I don't have a lot of specific examples here, but, but the care at home. So, so not hospital at home, not specifically, not home health specifically, but the transition of care from traditional settings to into the home more. We've seen a lot of successful conveners and things like that on the hospital at home side that have really taken off in the last couple of years. But, but I think five years from now, the sort of landscape of healthcare is going to look very different and the home is going to be a more important setting. And that's going to require 
a lot of digital tools in the flavor of some of the digital therapeutics and patient engagement, but it's going to have to go step beyond that. And so that's something that, that my colleague Michael Bodos and I have really been tracking heavily as home health moves into not, not strictly a Medicare you know, patient population, but, but everyone, both acute, you know, acute and chronic in nature. And so there's a ton of digital opportunity related to that. Thank you. And, and really this greater self-care, care at home, patients' engagement, a lot of things that tie together in terms of more patient responsibility tied to a, a convener or a product. And you also mentioned, which I love, the three service areas or the three lines, musculoskeletal, oncology, behavioral health, those three big areas where you, you mentioned data and analytics that can provide assistance and depth to practices, particularly in those areas, is a real high level of interest. Dr. Kapoor, where are you most excited and what do you see out there? Yeah, Scott, I mean, that's a, I agree with what's already been said, you know, just to give a perspective around my interest in digital health, you know, in 2021, there were 729 deals, nearly $21 billion raised. 2020, that was 14.9 billion. And just last year, we saw 88 mega deals of $100 million or more in fundraising for each company. It's remarkable to see these kind of numbers. And at the end of 2022, yeah, the deals were a little bit lower at 450 or so, totaling around 12 billion. That's still a lot of money. I'm particularly focused on, you know, and interested in startups that are addressing the growing labor shortages like Dr. Groves and Dave and Matt at all sort of identified, but more so identifying the growing administrative burden within healthcare. You know, there's a there's an understanding, there's already a response going on where there's a sort of growing shift of care outside of the four walls of the hospital with home health, telehealth centered around specifically preventative medicine, patient health literacy, specialty medicine, such as oncology, neurology, psychiatry, and so forth. We're seeing a growing number of companies focused on digital health. But again, the key to it all will be measurable utility and impact with some proven ROI. And that comes with, again, focusing on accessibility and affordability. You know, I think a lot of this work happens in silos saying you have some sort of a generation of idea, you create a solution, but it's never looked at within the workflow and addressing how is this actually going to impact and is there a need and how am I going to put it into a workflow where people are actually going to use it? Thank you very, very much. I mean, I mean, fascinating. There's so much of the thought around as it just becomes necessity is the mother of invention. So many things around workforce automation. How do we better address workforce automation? Just because there's not enough people for our population of 330 million people and growing, let alone on the planet of 8 billion and growing and aging and, and, and so forth. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. And Dr. Groves, where are you most excited? What are you most interested? Where are you most excited? And is there an area that you're not interested in that you know that not that you're not interested, in, but that you would not put resources into currently? There are a lot of areas that I'm interested in, and and I kind of like what Matt was saying about the boring stuff, and it reminded me of a a company, uh, Lintas, that works on using AI to maximize uh, a OR scheduling efficiency. That's a huge deal. When those ORs are sitting empty, that is just pure overhead with uh, nothing to show for it. And so using AI to predict, instead of using the old hierarchical model that uh, you know block, uh, uh, block surgery, uh, just makes so much sense. And, and so uh, uh, companies like that excite me. The other thing that I'm really excited about has to do with real prevention. What do I mean by that? I mean, you know, we know that there are really four or five things that drive health, and it's how much you sleep, uh, you know, it's what you eat, it's how much exercise you get, it's your connection and, uh, you know, to other human beings and a purpose. And, and uh, it, uh, companies like uh, Verda have managed to pull all of those together to drive remarkable performance. And these are real lifestyle changes that these folks are maintaining over time. And that's been a very difficult nut to crack. And I think we're on the verge of being able to crack that, not just in diabetes, but pre-diabetes and in obesity. Uh, you know, it, there's every reason to be excited about uh, uh, that group of uh, strategies. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to ask each of you one more question, just 30, 40 seconds on it. Is there an area that is more hype than reality 
that you're not particularly interested in at the current moment. That doesn't mean it won't be something in the future. It's an area that you're, you're less enthused about. Dr. Gross, let me start with you, then I'll go to Dr. Kapoor, then I'll go to Dave, and then I'll go to Matt. Anything, Dr. Well, Gross, that you're not particularly interested in right now? Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, and I don't want this to be misinterpreted, but telemedicine in the standard form Gosh, everybody and their brother has a telemedicine strategy right now, and it's not enough. It's just a tool. You know, it is just a tool. It's fantastic. It, it uh, you know, evens out geography. You can reach rural uh, populations. But there, I haven't seen anything new in telemedicine since 98.6 uh, pioneered the, you know, text first strategy. And so if it's just a telemedicine company that's that's looking for capital, I would not, uh, you know, if I were in the, uh, in the venture capital shoes, I would not be interested in that right now. Yes, you need telemedicine, but you need a lot more than that today to, to have an impact. Thank you very, very much. Dr. Kapoor, anything that you'd add on that you're not particularly focused on or excited about currently? Yeah, again, I, I agree with Dr. Groves. And the one space that I feel has been oversaturated is particularly wearable devices and IoT. And, you know, I think it more so there's little to no organization, and I've not seen the greatest impact in clinical medicine. It's an extremely tough market, you know, considering that it's consumer facing with little to no interest from hospital institutions due to lack of interoperability. Um, the sales cycle can be the sales cycle can be extremely tough. Major players like Apple are consolidating numerous features to their product lines. And so consumers are starting to face information overload and are becoming more selective of the information they're seeking. Particularly, they want information for a purpose and an expected outcome, as do the providers. So in that space, you know, I think there needs to be some sort of unifying force before more devices flood that market. Thank you very much. Dave, anything you'd like to add to the equation on areas that more hype than reality or, you know, don't really solve all the problems that are hyped to solve? Any thoughts there on things that you're not as excited about? Yeah, so I think both Dr. Groves and Dr. Kapoor took, took some of the ones I highlighted. My first would be just straight telemedicine. I think taking both of theirs a step further, employer health is something that's getting a lot of attention. And I think someone alluded to it earlier. There's plenty of employer health solutions that have low single digit engagement rates. They're not demonstrating new ROI. And they're really what we like to term a value on investment play, which is reliant on that high level of engagement but it maybe doesn't demonstrate the hard value to either the user, the patient, the customer, whatever you want to call them, the, the B2C person. And, and therefore, they're not demonstrating value to the, the either self-insured employer or, or maybe the fully insured TPA provider. And, and so I think that's one area that generally we're bullish on employer health as an opportunity overall, but, but there's ones that aren't clearly demonstrated in ROI or, or patient outcomes that are differentiated. Are, are an area I wouldn't be too excited about. But that point is so well taken. It's almost like software. There's so much software that's used just by, by a few people in an organization, so much of the patient engagement tools that are sold as this is going to solve all the problems on cardiology or something else, or, or you, cardiovascular disease, are used by so few people that when you find something that's actually used and engaging and people use enough, and, and maybe they got a strong enough condition, they're very worried about it that they're engaged in it, or it's really designed well, it's much more exciting, but you do see so much of these tools that aren't used very much. And, and I think the point is really well taken. Let me thank our audience for joining us today on, on this uh, webinar on Venture Capital Outlook for Healthcare 2023. I, I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Groves, Dr. Kapoor, Dave Davies, and Matt Wolf. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I always learn something when I talk to people that have such a great experience uh, in the area. So thank you so much. It sounds like it'll be a really interesting year in terms of VC and healthcare. Uh, as there's some rebounding in it, there's more reality placed around what's really needed and more of the focus around what's really needed uh, versus just humongous valuations, just a fascinating perspective. And uh, thank you each for sharing your thoughts with us today on this on this webinar. Thank you very, very much.